Hello, and welcome to our summer reading author series. My name is Virginia Grubbs, and it is my absolute honor to be part of tonight's events featuring the one and only best-selling author, Lisa C. Um, but before getting started, I do want to take this opportunity to encourage you to participate in this year's adult summer reading. Um, Summer reading is not just for kids, it's for everyone. But one of our core elements of the program is our reading challenge, um, which indulges your love of books, as well as giving you a chance to win a fabulous prize that you can see outside. Our game cards are actually right outside too, if you wanna pick one of those up. The good news is, because you registered tonight, everyone has a chance to win, you will be automatically enrolled into the raffle. Um, and so, also, just so you know, we have another author joining us next Tuesday, June 27th. It's David Gran, who is just wrote the best-selling book, The Wager. We hope you can be there for this. Um, and I know y'all have heard this, but a quick note and a humble thanks to all of our friends of the Darien Library, because of your contributions and support, you make these programs possible, and we are so grateful for your generosity. And to our good friends and partner, Barrett Bookstore, thank you for being here tonight, and she'll be here to sell the books, and you'll be doing a sign, Lisa will be doing a signing later. So, now on to the main event. I was not, I am not exaggerating when I tell you I gasped out loud when I found out that Lisa was gonna be here. Um, she, Lisa is the New York Times best-selling author of The Island of Sea Women, one of my favorite books, the Tea Girl of Humming, Hummingbird Lane, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, and that's just to name a few. Um, so stop my heart. I'm so happy to have you here, and um, I am so excited to welcome you and hear more about your newest book, Lady Tan's Circle of Women. Please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. I've been out on this crazy tour going to a state or a city a day. And um, I, I think this might be the hump day of, th of three weeks in a row being out. So, um, but that's only part of the tour. Anyway, before I start, I, I just want to say I hope you do come and hear David Grand Nick whenever that is, because I just finished reading that book. My husband and I listened to it on audio as an audio book, and it is fantastic. And so um, if I were living here, I would come to hear him. <laughs> and you can tell him I said so. <laughs> All right, so um, here I am to talk about Lady Tan's Circle of Women. You know, books come to me in really interesting ways, and I think about them for a very, very long time before I decide this is the one. And I do feel like there's a fair amount of sort of like fate, fortune, and destiny, maybe luck, that plays into how I come to a story. So, um, Again, I think about them for a long time. So like with Island of Sea Women, I thought about that for eight years before I started writing it. With Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, 20 years before I found my way into that story. But this one was very different. So you have to scroll back in time. Uh, Island of Sea Women came out in hardcover, and I began quietly doing some research for an idea that I'd been thinking about, for, again, for a very long time. And I was gathering stuff. A year later, the paperback came out for, uh, for Island of Sea Women, and I went out on a huge, what was going to be a, you know, one of these huge, huge six-week tours, a city a day, and all, blah, blah. And that was March 10th, 2020. I went to five states in five days, and then the country and the world shut down. So I went home. Now, the problem, you would think, oh, this is great. You're at home. You can work on your book. The problem with that other idea was that it was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into a very, very remote part of China. No way to do that in 2020. <laughs> 2021, 2022, and even today, I'd be pretty reluctant to go anywhere in the world as remote as this particular area is. So that idea was just back on the shelf. And so there I was at home, 24 hours a day with my husband, and um, feeling very much at loose ends. You know, we all kept hearing about essential workers, and turns out not very many of us are essential. Writers, definitely not essential. 
And there really was a part of me that just, I don't mean to sound melodramatic about this, but a part of me that felt, well, my life is over. <laughs> I can't go to China. I can't go to any of the research libraries, any, any library archive, all of that stuff was closed. And in fact, I live in Los Angeles, all of that remained closed for the whole time that I ended up working on this book. So there I was at home at loose ends, my life is over. I bought my first ever pair of pajamas. <laughs> I bought my second ever pair of pajamas. I mean that, you know, this is where life was in my house. And then it wasn't until October, so a lot of months went by with me moping around, that I was walking through my office and I have this you know, big wall of research books and the spine of one of those books kind of jumped out at me. I don't know why. Pale gray uh, jacket with slightly darker gray lettering. But for whatever reason, it jumped out, I pulled it down, reproducing women, pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. Not exactly the most exciting topic. And you know, when I looked, I had had that book on my shelf for 10 years and had never opened it. So I thought to myself, well, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, my life is over, I guess this is the time. And so I sat down right that minute and started to read. I got to page 19 and there was a mention of a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty who, when she turned 50 in 1511, published a book, book of her medical cases. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I set the book down, I went to the computer, started looking to see what I could find out about her, and it turned out that her book was available not only in Chinese, but available in English. And so while I am a huge, huge, huge supporter of independent bookstores, I may have ordered that from... <laughs> and I had it within 24 hours. And so with, from, instead of thinking about this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, yeah, this was all of 26 hours. And I knew what the next book was going to be. Now, what was it about her and all of this that just so obsessed me right away? So think about it. 1511, how many books can you think of that are still in print from before 1511? The Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies, Beowulf. We could get beyond the Western canon, say the Mahabharata in China, the I Ching, um, Book of Songs, Book of Odes. But all of those written by men. Beowulf, did I say Beowulf? It's in there too. But all of those written by men. There are a couple of things that have survived that were written by women. Tales of Genji from Japan. And then in the 1100s, there was a Catholic nun named Hildegard von Bingen who wrote two books that I think of uh, almost like um, recipe books for women, for women's health. And so these had all kinds of herbal remedies and things that you could make that would help you with cramps. And maybe you want to get pregnant. Maybe you wanted to end an unwanted pregnancy. This Catholic nun who had recipes in her books for that. Anyway. But there you are, you know, you have a couple of almost two millennia in there and all of a sudden um, you start to see a few women getting published that we still hear about, right? The Bronte sisters, Jane Austen, Emily Dickinson, George Sand, but they're pretty few and far between. And it's not until about 100 years ago in the 1920s that Virginia Woolf publishes one of her first novels and that really changes things for women writers. So um, I just thought that was amazing. You know, I just thought, I just couldn't get this out of my mind, and plus the fact that she had published this when she turned 50. So I thought that was all great. And then of the 12,000 known medical texts, historic medical texts in China, 12,000, only three were written by women, and this is the oldest. All right, very little is known about her life. Um, in her book, Miscellaneous Records of a Female Doctor, there's some couple of different forewords, there are a couple of afterwords. She also wrote an introduction about her life and how she became a doctor. When she was eight years old, she went to live with her grandparents. And um, at night, her grandfather liked to drink wine and have her recite poetry to him. 
And apparently, and this is what she herself wrote, he once said, this girl is very intelligent. We should not restrict her to ordinary needlework, but instead we can let her study my medicine. Now, he had retired from his imperial scholar job and had become what's known as a literati doctor, a doctor, someone who learns how to be a doctor by reading books. But his wife, Tanyan Shun's grandmother, was a hereditary doctor. She'd learned from her parents, who'd learned from their parents, who'd learned from their parents, and so on. And so she's really the person who taught Tanyan Shun how to be a doctor. Now, this girl, she was pretty sickly. I'm not giving too much away to say that there are several times in this story that she does come close to death because she, she just was sickly. And there did come a point where she was so close to death that her husband and mother-in-law sat by her bedside. She could hear them planning her funeral. And that night, her grandmother, who had long ago left this earth and was, you know, was in the afterworld, um, came to visit her. And this ghost, or actually this apparition, came in, and I'm going to paraphrase here. She was like, okay, enough of this being sick business. Um, you are a bad example to your family. Uh, and I want you to go to one of my old notebooks. And if you look on page 78, you're going to find a remedy there. If you make it according to my directions and take it, you're going to be cured. And this is going to be the last of your illnesses. And uh, not only that, I'm here to tell you that you're going to live to be 73 years old. Now, her grandmother was right in the sense that she was cured. She never really went back to having these, old, these ailments. But she was wrong about how long this woman would live. It wasn't 73. She lived to be 96. 96, pretty good today. Really remarkable in the 1500s. So what else captivated me about her? She really circumvented the rules for women in that time. So if you, you know, go back to this Ming Dynasty, this is a time when Confucian thought really has control or influences society, culture, the family. Now Confucius, I don't want to be mean to him. He did, had a lot of great thought. He was a brilliant man, but he... I think it's fair to say he didn't care very much for women. And you, I'm going to guess, have read some of my books, so you know some of his aphorisms, things like, uh, when a girl, obey your father, when a wife, obey your husband, when a widow, obey your son. An educated woman is a worthless woman. A good woman will never take more than three steps beyond her front door. So here was a woman who did follow many of the Confucian rules. She went into an arranged marriage at age 15. She had four children. She managed this big traditional household. And yet she found a way to become a doctor and treat women and, and girls. So um, that was that. The second really had to do with these traditions around traditional Chinese medicine. So in those days, and until very, very recently, in traditional Chinese medicine, there was this saying, a woman is 10 times more difficult to treat than a man. Now, of course, they would have that belief because 99.9999999% of all doctors were men. And the thing is that men, male doctors, could not be in the same room with their female patients, whether it was a girl or a woman. And so what would happen is the doctor would sit behind a curtain or behind a screen, or better yet, he'd be out in the hallway. And then the little girl's father or a woman's husband would act as the go-between. So he'd get the question from the doctor, run over to the patient, get the answer, run back. Now, I love my husband and sons very, very much but I uh, would not really like them to be the go-between between, between me and we'll just say like my gynecologist, right? <laughs> but she could be in the room with her patients. She could look at their complexion. Were they pale? Were they flushed? Did they have a rash? Were they swollen? She could smell them. She could take their pulses. And so in Chinese medicine, you have 26 separate pulses. 
but obviously you have to be able to touch someone to do that. Now, there were certain occasions when a male doctor could take a woman's pulse if she was truly near death. And they would come and wrap her arm, often in like bind, you know, foot binding um, cloth. So wrap her arm in these layers and layers of cloth and then stick her arm through a curtain and he would come and try to feel through all these layers of cloth, <laughs> not too effective. But the most important thing was that she could talk to her patients, woman to woman. And she had been through herself every phase of a woman's life. She had been a little girl. She'd gone through adolescence. She'd gotten married and had a wedding night with someone she never had seen before. She had four children on and on until eventually she got the lovely gift of menopause. So she had really experienced all these different aspects of a woman's physical life. Most of the cases that she's written about, scholars believe, are the women and girls who lived in her husband's compound. And so this was a very wealthy family, an elite family. And in those days, you, you, know, you would live in a big, big compound with different courtyards, different parts of the family. You'd be living with like 40 to 100 of your husband's relatives. Um, my idea of hell. <laughs> and so these, you know, most of the patients are believed to be these, these um, elite women and girls but also the, the servants who took care of them. There are a couple of exceptions. One is the woman who steers the, uh, you know, holds the tiller on a ship. There's another one who is a brick and tile maker. If Tanya Shun was never supposed to go more than three feet beyond her front gate, how did she come in contact with those women? And so this was something that just totally obsessed me from that very first day. And this, of course, led to doing research. But China was closed. I live very close to UCLA. I've been in all seven research libraries. Every single one was closed. All the archives were closed. But by now, I do have a certain body of knowledge. I've been doing this a pretty long time. And so there were things like, she lived in a what was called, in Wuxi, which is a water town in, in the Yangtze Delta. And if you think of the Yangtze Delta kind of like the Mississippi Delta, where you have all these tributaries and little towns built along those tributaries, but in China, they are like li miniature Venices, Venice. So, you know, the way you have the houses built right on the canals and people are going back and forth, you know, all the commerce and everything that takes place on these canals. And while I had never been to Wuxi, I had been to many other water towns and had stayed in different water towns, especially when I was doing research for Peony and Love. The other uh, piece was the, the idea of her house. And again, I had been in, I had, her house no longer exists, but I had been in many of these big traditional Chinese houses. And also the big, not every big compound had a garden, but some of them did have these very elaborate gardens. And so in Los Angeles, at the Huntington, we have um, the humble, uh, the, uh, there's a scholar's garden that's, um, inspired by the humble administrator's garden in Sujo. I've been to that one. I've been to the one at the Huntington. I've been to many of those other gardens in China. And so I had a very good sense of how to create what would become the Garden of Fragrant Delights. There was also a single object that I, I used. Now, my family, I grew up in a very large Chinese-American family in Los Angeles. And my great-great-grandparents great, great um, started um, going to China in the late 1890s or in the 1890s and buying stuff and bringing it back and, and our family's been in the Chinese antique business for well over a hundred years now and so they would do things like go into a village and say we like your temple we'll buy it and then they would take it apart and bring it home and then we would keep it because what else, you know you're gonna keep it and one of those things that they bought and brought home was a traditional marriage bed. Now, the way to think about a marriage bed is you, you'd have this platform, the sleeping platform, and most of them just a simple sleeping platform surrounded by these um, walls of carved wood. 
But this one is much more elaborate. It has three rooms. And uh, it's made out of about 20 different types of wood. And so on the front, there's a carved, big carved um, canopy, these carved wooden tassels that hang down. That first room is where the servant sleeps in case you need anything in the night. Not a lot of privacy, but you know, <laughs> in case you need something, a cigarette or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> The next room it was the dressing room, and then you entered through a big carved moon gate onto the sleeping platform, which was surrounded on all sides by these um, paintings on silk that showed images of domestic bliss. You know, a lovely couple walking by the stream, you know, for another one, she's playing a, a, you know, an instrument, and he's writing poetry to her. So really beautiful. When I was a child, this was my playhouse. And this is where I played with all of my cousins. It's where my children played with their cousins. And of course, when we all have grandchildren old enough, that's where they're all going to play too. So I used that um, marriage bed as the, as the marriage bed that's in this book. But after that, here was where fate, fortune, destiny came back into play. I had to do more research, obviously. So one of the first people I wanted to find was the woman who had done the translation of this original book. And I went to the internet, and again, I'm poking around trying to find her, and I did eventually. Of all the places she could live in the world, she lived in Santa Monica about 10 minutes from my house. <laughs> Now, this was still year one of the pandemic. No way we could see each other. No one was vaccinated yet, but we did meet on Zoom a couple times a week. She would tell me different scholars I should talk to. She would send me a note and say, oh, you know, somebody's giving a lecture on uh, ghost pregnancies at two in the morning our time in Singapore. You should watch it, and I would. There was another a professor at UC Irvine who's been incredibly helpful to me over the years. His, his area of expertise is Shanghai, and this didn't have anything to do with Shanghai, but he knows everyone. And so I could send him a note and say, you know, because, well, I'll just say, sometimes you're writing and all of a sudden it's like you need somebody to write a letter. You, know, you just need to get some information across, you know, over there, right? Did they have a male system in the Ming Dynasty? Who knows? Well, it turns out there's someone who has spent like the last 40 years of his life writing and studying the Ming, Ming Dynasty male system. Another thing that I was looking for, and again, it was only when I got to it, how long would it take to go from Wuxi up to Beijing on the Grand Canal in 1496? This is not like looking up the Amtrak schedule. <laughs> it was really hard to find. And I wrote to Jeff again, and he put me in contact with someone who put me in contact and so on down the road, until finally I, somebody told me about um, a book that, uh, that had been translated as someone's um, master's thesis. And what this book was, was there was a man who had been appointed, a Korean man who'd been appointed ambassador to the island of Jeju. Jeju is where I had, you know, where um, Island of Sea Women is set. And on his way to Jeju in 1496, he was shipwrecked off the coast of California and then taken prisoner and sent to the capital on the Grand Canal. For one year, he kept a diary. And so each day, he wrote down what he saw, how long, how far they could travel, what he ate, what the weather was like. This was an incredible find. And then last, I'll just tell you very quickly about a professor at Harvard who also was just unbelievably helpful to me. We would meet on Zoom quite a bit, and I just couldn't believe that he would even answer my email. But I do think there was something going on with the pandemic that I think all these people were having their version of my life is over. <laughs> I just bought my you know, first pair of pajamas. <laughs> and so that we really had this way to connect and talk about the things that we really care about. And there was somebody on the other side. I mean, you can imagine, I hope this man isn't here, the one who has studied um, the Ming Dynasty mail system for 40 years. 
you know, if you were married to him, <laughs> you might be thinking, oh, please, you know, please let him find someone else to talk to about that when you're living together 24 hours a day. So thank you to Zoom, but I also have to thank Twitter. So there was, and I, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, you can follow along. Uh, but I do follow a site called China in Pictures, and he posts these um, old photos of China, sometimes old videos. And one day he put up a photo from Wuxi. And I didn't know him, but I sent a note and said, do you happen to know if there are any Ming Dynasty buildings still in existence in Wuxi? I mean, this is, again, 1500s. That's a long time ago. The next day, he, had sent, he sent me a list of 40 sites still in existence in Wuxi. But not only that, photographs, videos, videos of the Grand Canal during the day, at night, in the afternoon from 1955. I mean, it was just an incredible gift uh, when I couldn't go there. But mainly I kept going back to Tan Yunshan's actual cases, the daughter of a concubine who suffers from food damage caused by excessive uh, love, a woman whose ailments stem from too much weeping, a young wife who uh, has given birth and is suffering from something called postpartum wind itching. You do not want to have that. Um, so I also drew on other contemporaneous stories of women and, and particularly about women's health and giving birth. And so I, I am going to just digress here for one second to say that just before the book tour, I was interviewed for a podcast and it was a lovely interview and we had talked about 45 minutes. It was going to be an hour. And right around that 45 minute mark, the woman said to me, you know, I really, you know, I, I hope you understand. I really love your books, but they're kind of cringy. I'm thinking cringy, cringy. Oh yeah, they are kind of cringy. There are a lot of things that happen that are kind of cringy. And I, when I find stuff, when I'm doing research, it's kind of cringy. I'm just like, I've got to use that. And so uh, I will say, and you know, I don't think I'm giving too much away. And when you come to these scenes, you'll just remember what I told you, the worm, the message on the baby's foot and something that happens in front of the empress, all three of those things happen to real women. So just keep that in mind when you get to them. And of course, because I write about women and I write about mothers and daughters and, and sisters, but I always keep coming back to friendship. And so Yanshan has a friend, Mei Ling, whose mother is a midwife, and now she is learning to be a midwife as well. And so these two girls are brought together in this very unlikely uh, friendship that's sanctioned by the mother and the grandmother. And I, I do keep coming back to women's friendship because it is a relationship that we have in our lives that's unlike any other. We will tell a friend something that we wouldn't tell a boyfriend, a lover, a husband, our mother, our children. It's a very, very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, whenever you have your heart open like that, you are open to being hurt. And so whenever I, I love to write about the best parts of friendship, but I also see those dark shadow sides. And wherever I see those little dark shadows, that's where I want to go. Now, I don't like to read from my work, but I, I did want to just read to you a couple of sayings about friendship that I used. Friendship is a contract between two hearts. With two hearts united, women can laugh and cry, live and die together. A friend without faults will never be found. It takes a lifetime to make a friend, but you can lose one in an hour. Also true. Life without a friend is life without son. Life without a friend is death. Now, I was very surprised as I was working on this book how relevant the story would turn out to be. I mean, obviously, we were living in this pandemic. But in the research I was doing, I learned that in China in those days, smallpox raged through the country every three years. 
China invented something called variolation. It's a very early form of vaccination. And here's a cringy thing, so get ready. So what they would do, they had a smallpox planting master, and he would collect the scabs from people who had died from smallpox, grind them up, and then blow them through a tube into someone's nose. They would also take the gooey, 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 gooey stuff that was oozing out of those sores and then rub it on a baby's nose. Now, obviously, there were some problems with this. You could get very sick, you could get scarred, you could die. And what just blew me away is that in those days, in the 1500s, they were having the exact same arguments, discussions, um, two sides about whether this, you know, is a good thing or a bad thing. The, I mean, with the exact same language that we have been hearing for the last three years. And then the other was, um, I was about done with the first draft when the Dobbs decision came down. And obviously there is a lot in this book about who has control over women's bodies. And of course, we're having that discussion now. We were having it in Tanyan Shun's day in the 1500s, certainly in that Catholic nun's days in the 1100s. I suspect if we went back to caveman days, they were already saying, like, who has control over women's bodies? And that when we're all living on Mars, we're going to still be arguing about that. Before I end, I just want to say a couple of things. I talked to a lot of book clubs on Zoom. In fact, during the pan worst of that first year, I some days would talk to four book clubs a day. You guys saved me from really going totally crazy. Uh, and I would even get out of my pajamas to do it. <laughs> um, so I, uh, we um, have a really great reader's guide on my website with discussion questions. There are also activities to do in your book club. I have on my website for every book something called Step Inside the World of Tea Girl, Island of, you know, Sea Women, in this case, Lady Tan, where I have videos, photographs, articles, um, all kinds of stuff. You can see marriage beds, you can learn about foot binding, you can learn about medicine, all the stuff is there that I found. Um, for Island, for Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, Bana Tea Company created a tea tasting package to drink with, uh, when, when you, for book clubs to drink when they read um, Tea Girl. And now she has created this really beautiful one for this book. And uh, it has the teas that Yanshan and Meiling drink. And the reason that they drink those teas is because they're two of my favorites. And so uh, you can, this is a package for a book club of 10, but she's also created one for people who aren't in a book club who just want to drink, a, you know, read the book and sip the teas that are in the book. And so I have a link to her website on my website. All right. When she died at age 96, um, her book started to fall out of the marketplace, you know, and, and people weren't reading it anymore. They couldn't find it. And she had a great nephew who wanted to rescue it from obscurity. So he found a copy. He copied it out with brush and ink. He paid to have the wood blocks carved. He published it. I do have photographs of the original text, again, on that step inside the world of. And um, he wrote the final afterward. And in it, he wrote, May she leave a noble name that will not decline in the future. And I hope in my small way that I've added to saving her noble name. But more importantly, by reading her story, all of you are helping to save her noble name. Thank you so much. So do we, I, we have some time for questions. Uh, my website is so easy, www.lisac.com. <laughs> so really easy. Yes. Okay, so what's my writing process? So first, um, a book typically takes me about two years. The majority of time is spent on the research. The writing is actually the least amount of time, and editing is somewhere in the middle. I, um, because the writing takes so much time, that is, that you know, that's months and months and months. But when I, when I start writing, 
I can tell you that I write the last sentence first. That's when I know I can start writing is when the last sentence comes to me. It usually comes to me pretty early. And that way, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know where I want to end up emotionally in the story. Uh, so then when I'm writing, I write a 1,000 words a day, which is just four pages. I keep a notebook where I keep my, my, num my word counts. Um, sometimes I can do that in about two hours. Sometimes it can take me eight or ten. If it's taking me that long, it's probably not very good. But I stick there and butt in the chair until I get that thousand words. And sometimes I'm at like 978. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, I, but I'll stay there till I get the thousand. Um, what else can I tell you? What, what, did that help? Okay. Yeah, I, I would say that, so how do I structure everything together? I, I do start at the, once I have that last sentence, I start at the beginning and write straight through. Um, there are many writers who make that first sentence perfect and then the first paragraph perfect and the first page perfect. I just go, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but I just start at the beginning and go all the way through. And I don't worry too much. I don't worry about those days that the writing was not going well. I just write straight through because I know I can go back and, and fiddle with it. Now, this book I structured, actually, I don't know if any of you read Snowflower and the Secret Fan, but it does have the same four um, sections. M um, milk days, when you're little, um, hair pinning days, when you're getting ready for marriage, rice and salt days, those days of chores, <laughs> we'll just say, and then sitting quietly, basically, after menopause, right? So I, I felt like that really worked well for her life, and it, and it tied into uh, the way sh she was learning medicine and practicing medicine, and, and it just worked well for me, again. Um, but in terms of the actual sort of structure, so there are certain things that I find that I can't move. Um, she was born in a certain year. Her grandmother died in a certain year. I can't move those things around. The, the, there is an emperor who makes an appearance. He became emperor in a certain year and was only emperor for a short amount of time. Um, so those are things, I look at them like signposts along the way. They're unmovable because those are tied to actual dates. Then there are other things where uh, it's just part of your story, right? It's, um, you know, this little girl is going to go live with her grandparents. Why? Uh, she has to get to where they live. Um, she's going to meet this other little girl. There's going to be some reasons why these two girls shouldn't know each other, and yet at some point the grandmother and the midwife are going to agree that these two girls can be friends. That's all in the first 60 pages. But these are, you know, things that have to happen. Then later, it's like somebody gets married. Typically, it's around nine months to have a baby, right? Or 10, depending on how you're counting. I once um, turned in a book, and it went through all the editing and everything. And then finally, when it was at, in the copy editing stage, the copy editor wrote and said, do you realize that this woman's been pregnant for 18 months? <laughs> I was like, ooh, and I had, you know, moved a scene. I had cut and, you know, just moved it up or back, and it was like I lost lost track of that pregnancy in there. Um, but those things are are flexible, and I can put them where I want. And s other kinds of things, like you know, if there's if, if I'm not saying it's going to happen in this book, but if a smallpox epidemic came through. Where is it in the story? Is it in the beginning? Is it in the end, middle? Is it in the end? Why is it there? What's the ripple effect? And then, um, so when I so I have these signposts, and then when I sit down to write, I don't know how I'm going to get there. I just know where I'm going, and that to me is where the really creative part is happening. Is how how am I going to get that girl from here to there, from here to that next one, and from here to there? And that's, to me, that's the magical part of writing. So I have never been one of those authors who gets that in her contract of, of having a say. 
but I am so lucky that my publisher actually asked my opinion. <laughs> And actually, with this book, there was a first jacket, and I, and I don't even remember it now, but I didn't like it. And then they did this jacket, and I loved the image. It was so perfect. Um, and then there were several different iterations, like should it be dark green? Should it be light green? Should it be purple? Should it be gold as the background? And so all of these different ones were made and sent to me, and then I put them all around the room and then kind of live with them for a few days. But this one was by far the most beautiful. I mean, it, it is such a stunning jacket. Um, I absolutely love it. But I, I, I do think it's nice um, when the author can have a say in what the jacket looks like because in your mind as a writer, you, you're visualizing something. You know, and I couldn't have even said what it was, but I knew it when I saw it. And I knew what was wrong. That's the main, th you know, I knew what was right, but I also knew what was wrong. Uh, anyway, I'm so lucky that I have the publisher ID for that. Oh, Wuxi, it's W-U-X-I. W -U -W and so it's in the Yangtze Delta. If, you know, Shanghai is down here. And if you just went up, up the Yangtze, it's off on one of the tributaries. Well, to who knows it was Shanghai, Jiangsu, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing research on foot binding now for something like 30 years, so it's not one particular source. Do you want some particular ones? Dorothy Ko wrote a, has written a couple of books. One is called Cinderella Slippers. Um, there's a woman, Beverly Jackson, who has written a couple of books. But there are also, you know, all kinds of more like academic essays that have been done that are in academic journals. So there's, you know, it depends on how you're looking at foot binding. Is it the actual physical process? Is it the, uh, the social and cultural reasons for it? Is it, um, you know, are, what the iconography of the embroidery on bound foot shoes is, I mean, there's really a lot out there that you could discover. Oh, you're not the man who's been in <laughs> mail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. That is such a great question because it is so true. I mean, just think about if you wanted to set a story a hundred years ago. We all have a sense of what the Roaring Twenties was like, right? We've all seen The Great Gatsby, we've read The Great Gatsby, we know about flappers, we know what the haircut looked like, we even have a sense of the cards. I mean, you know, we have a pretty good idea of that. You could say, um, you know, stories of the American West. Well, there's, again, it's like movies and television that we have learned that, but also all kinds of novels, right? So we have a sense of how people got around. Um, if you're thinking of, of like pioneer days, Laura Ingalls Wilder, all those books had so much like practical, how to make butter, how to make cheese, how to, you know, clean something, had all this practical information. But there really is very little visually apart from painting um, from the Ming Dynasty, you know, there, there's, th that is easily access accessible and not a whole lot of movies that we can easily find that sort of show you again that sort of visual um, idea of what it was like and how people lived and just how they did just those really practical things that are so much a part of our lives now, like how would you get water, how did you heat your house, um, you know, what did you wear, what, what, how did you make makeup? This was a time a lot of makeup, but all of it was made out of these really interesting um, things. And actually there's a woman on uh, YouTube who has all these great videos where she makes lipstick in the Ming Dynasty way, or she makes, um, you know, d different things. You go to my website, you can find the link. I can't remember her name, but I do have links to some of her stuff there. So there, you know, you have to just keep looking, but it's not as readily accessible as Elizabethan England. You know, it's just, it's just not stuff that we have as close to us and, and easy to reach. 
Well, I can only write in English, so <laughs> it better work. <laughs> but I, I, you know, not so much with this book. I mean, I will read a lot of poetry from that particular era, trying to get a sense of the images and metaphors that were used um, that are really tied to a particular time or aphorisms that were used to a particular time. The one where I really concentrated on that in a different way was Snowflower and the Secret Fan. Because if you think about, I was trying to think if the, this was actually written in um, the secret language, there were only about 800 characters. And so it had to be very simple. And the sentences had to be short and clear and, and not a lot of syllables even to them. So it was a real, that was like a whole, um, almost like a game to figure that out. And then, and, and, um, I do, I think all of these books are in the first person, but also in the present. And one of the things about Chinese is that it, it, there, there aren't a lot of tenses. You, you have the verb, but how you know when it, that when the time is, as you say, 10,000 years ago, five in right now, today, three years from now, but the, the verb itself doesn't change. And that's very hard to capture, but by keeping it kind of in a present, it, it conveys that idea a little bit in my head. I don't know that anybody else picks up on it, but that's just me. Okay. Do I have a favorite book of mine? That's like asking, which is my favorite child? <laughs> and of course, you know, all know the answer. It depends on the day. But the real answer, of course, is we say we love you equally, but we love you differently. And I think that is true with the books. I do have a special relationship with each one that really depends or was influenced by like where I was in my life at that time or what I was writing about. And, um, you know, I could go through each one and tell you why, but, but it, it's, it's so personal and it is like kids in that way. I do. <laughs> Funny you should ask. Uh, yes, no, I do. And uh, this one has as its historic backdrop the 1871 uh, Chinatown Massacre in Los Angeles. This was a time in when Los Angeles only had 5,000 people. It was considered the wildest of all the Wild West towns. Why do wilder than Deadwood, more violent than Dodge City, Laramie. Why do we not, more murders than in New York City at this tiny little town. So why, what, why don't we know that? I'll just tell you the answer, movies. Um, so when those first people were making films, it was a time of a big land boom in Los Angeles and they didn't want to portray Los Angeles in a negative light. So all of those movies, all those ways we know about, you know, all the shoot 'em ups and Wyatt Earp and all that stuff is because of movies and, and they left out all the things that were happening in Los Angeles because it was really bad there. Anyway, um, only 5,000 people, 10% of the population participated in this riot and massacre, 10% of the Chinese were killed. Um, I'm writing it from the perspective of three women who are based on real women who lived through that time. Um, and it's not just about the massacre, it's the whole city and what was happening. And I keep thinking about them. You know, only 34 Chinese women in this really wild, rough town having come from China uh, that I'm just gonna say was a lot more civilized than Los Angeles at that time. And so one woman is uh, the very young and beautiful, I think of her like the Helen of Troy of the piece. She was the young, beautiful wife of an older, wealthy merchant. She was kidnapped and eventually her kidnapping is what led to this riot. The next one is the wife of the Chinese doctor. The Chinese doctor was the most popular doctor in the city. He, most of his clients were white, that's because he had 2,000 years of Chinese medicine behind him, and of course, Western medicine was of the leech and, and um, patent medicine kind of quackery. 
Um, so he was hugely popular and very respected. He was the second person killed. And then the third one is based on two women who were sold by their families in China, brought here, and then sold into prostitution. And even though slavery had been outlawed in, in our country at that point, there was this exception in California for Chinese women. And so they were bought and sold with zero rights and zero choices. And these two women, from the moment they landed, all they tried to do was escape and find freedom. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for coming.